Welcome to Author Stories, the podcast where we talk to the best writers in the industry and discuss writing and the creative process. Whether you're a writer, a reader, or both, we hope you'll find something here that makes you love books and the writers that create them. You can find archives of all of the great conversations I've had with authors over the years at hankgarner.com. Take some time and browse around there. I'm sure you'll find a new author to love, find inspiration for your own creative life, and find a new story to get lost in. The story behind the stories is what you get here, and today we talk with Andrew Gross. Andrew joins me today to talk about his new book, The Fifth Column, a new historical thriller that is a slight departure from books you might expect from him. We talk about his time as James Patterson's very first co-writer and what he learned about storytelling and planning from James, as well as the story behind The Fifth Column. Before we get to today's interview with Andrew, let's thank some folks that make this show possible. Edge of Valor, a military sci-fi thriller by Josh Hayes. When their mission fails, his begins. David Weber calls it a tour de force. Special Agent Jackson Fisher is a man after truth. When a military operation to extract a high-ranking ambassador from the war-torn border world of Stonemeyer ends in disaster, Fisher is called in to investigate. A whole platoon went in, but only three Alliance Marines returned home. The rest killed in action along with hundreds of civilians. With tensions between the Holloman Alliance and Stonemeyer rising, Fisher attempts to stitch the pieces together. One thing becomes more and more certain. The surviving Marines are lying. As the truth unfurls, Fisher begins to realize this was far more than a simple rescue mission and that the truth might be something best left buried. Filled with action, mystery, and well-crafted characters, Edge of Valor, the Valor series book one, will put you into a world of war, conspiracy, and betrayal. It's perfect for fans of David Weber's Honorverse or Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan with a futuristic flair. That's Edge of Valor by Josh Hayes. Chronicle of the Five by Garrett Godrick from book one. A peculiar boy with a remarkable ability, a secret society on a dark crusade, an extraordinary device that could change the world. 14-year-old Cody Calder is a frightened, insecure boy who wants nothing more than to find courage and self-worth, and he has a difficult decision to make. He can go with his family and confront his fears or stay behind and hide at his uncle's farm. If he stays, he must say goodbye to the two most important people in his life. If he goes, his decision could change him forever. Cody's choice lands him in a faraway place where he finds himself on an unexpected path filled with mind-bending twists of fate and decision, and Cody's quest for self-discovery becomes a nightmare as he struggles to survive in an extraordinary new world, one he never knew existed. Book 1, Dark Revenant, and Book 2, Dark Legacy are available now with Book 3 coming soon. Chronicle of the Five by Garrett Godrick. R.J. Pinero and his brand new book, Chilling Effect, a global climate thriller. A ruthless eco-terrorist, a woman determined to stop him. Chilling Effect, R.J. Panera's newest thriller, explores a world in the not-too-distant future where terrorism is taken to a new level, one with world-ending consequences. You never know what you're capable of until the monster inside of you pushes you beyond your moral line in the sand. These are the opening thoughts of former climatologist William Christed as he prepares to attack our delicate ecosystem. He's hell-bent on avenging his father's death and will go to extremes of terrorism never before seen, all to strike a blow to those whose hubris led to his father's demise. He will take full advantage of the greed and narcissism ever-present in the world, as well as the fragility of our planet to ecological terrorism, and use it to plot a scenario so grim, yet so compellingly real, it could have ripped from today's headlines. Check out the brand new thriller Chilling Effect from R.J. Pinero. Michael Anderley has a brand new series that's launching. It's called Opus X, and the first book is Obsidian Detective. Two rebels whose worlds collide on a planetary level. On the fringes of human space, a murder will light a fuse and send two different people colliding together. She lives on Earth, where peace among the population is a given. He is on the fringe of society, where authority is how much power you wield. She's from the powerful, the elite, he's with the military. Both want the truth, but is revealing the truth good for society? Check out Obsidian Detective, the very first book that's up for pre-order now, from the new series Opus X by Michael Anderley. 
If you love comics the way I do, go check out Cool Comics in My Collection at edgosney.com. Ed runs one of the best comics blogs on the internet. New episodes each Thursday come out, digging into the things that we have loved about comics and comic collecting. There's something there for everyone. Go check out Cool Comics in My Collection at edgosney.com. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Andrew Gross on the show with me today. Andrew is one of my favorite uh, thriller authors. He has uh, more than 16 books out all over. Uh, if you're a thriller lover like I am, then you have at least one or two of Andrew's books on your shelf. Uh, but Andrew has a brand new book that's a little bit of a departure called The Fifth Column, and we're going to talk all about it today. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Thank you, Hank. Great to be there. Hopefully more than one or two even. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's. Yeah, I, I was just, you know, trying to have easy access for people, but yeah. I'm just um, kidding. Just joking. <laughs> we begin each show with the same question, and that question is what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Hmm. Um, well, there's no question. It goes back to. Uh, um, I guess high school days. Uh, I actually wrote poetry in high school, and um, one of the ways I got into college um, um, was to have published uh, in uh, um, the uh, in uh, Poetry Magazine, which was a national publication. Um, I, whether or not that's exactly what I'm doing now. Um, it was, um, it was what I was doing in high school. Um, and only, um, o only in college did I sort of, uh, change and start doing, uh, um, start doing prose. Um, so, you know, I guess I, if you, if you really wanted my earliest, uh, in terms of writer, it would, it would be there. And I, I, I can kind of remember that I wrote a poem to a, uh, to um, a, a sailor um, who sailed around the world single, uh, uh, you know, alone by the name of uh, William Willis. And it was uh, an elegy. And I guess he tried it a second time and didn't survive. So um, it was probably the thing that I did best at that point and um, got into print. So I would have to say that's where it begins for me. That is fascinating. Uh, there, There's something about poetry that connects uh, on a on a heart level, in a, in a in a deeper way, and for for some weird reason, and people try to crack the code, and it, and it looks so simple, and it is so difficult to get your your hands around. Do you uh, look back fondly on your time writing poetry, and do you feel like that experience informs the uh, the prose that you write? Um, I, I, I wish I could say it did. You know, I wrote sort of lyrical stuff. I mean, I was a teenager and maybe had been a little older in college. And um, I, I, I look back now, I mean, occasionally I'll end up coming across a folder of the stuff. And sometimes I'm pleased with what I did. Other times it, it uh, gives me sort of a rash. It's so it, it, it was so overwritten. But the truth is that that sort of level of writing, descriptive writing, whenever I engage in it now, it's usually it's usually some of the stuff that doesn't make it to the final draft. Um, and uh, so, you know, I write in a much leaner way at this point, and the work that I put into um, language at that point, not to say that I don't pay attention to every word that gets on a page now, but the kind of work that I put into descriptiveness then, I put into um, nuance of character now in my mind. So the slightly different sides of the coin. There's definitely an economy of, of words or an economy of, um, uh, of description that you get from writing poetry that, you know, getting the most with the, with the least amount of space. Right. But I always joke um, that uh, whenever I sort of feel that I have these um, soaring flights of language that um, make me feel like, well, you know, they, I, I've reached some kind of height that I'm proud of, I'll take it down, you know, show my wife and 
toss it in front of her and say, this is why they pay me the big bucks, right? And then she'll read it and goes, oh, um, this is a piece of crap. And and I go, what are you talking about? You know, what do you know about this stuff anyway? And I'll go back upstairs and, you know, take a second or third look at it. And the thing that seems so, you know, <laughs> so, so, so perfectly phrased before now just seems like overwriting or pretension or, or, or even worse, confusion. So, um, she's not always my my best editor, but um, but I think she 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 doesn't have a uh, much of a nose for that sort of level of uh, craftsmanship. So she usually right. What so what what happened with the switch uh, to prose? What was the instigating factor that uh, that drove you there? Well, to be honest with you, the first piece of prose that I ever wrote. Um, got to number one on the New York Times bestseller list, <laughs> um, which I don't think there's too many people who can say that. Certainly the first piece of prose I ever published, I, I guess, uh, in all honesty, when I made a transition, I was in business for a couple of decades um, and managed uh, sports apparel companies. Um, and when it turned out that I made a transition to this line of work, I I, in order to sort of try to hone in on a voice or a craft, I was writing autobiographical um, short stories. And uh, just because it was low-hanging fruit and it was easy to do, um, although a couple of them weren't half bad, um, but the first thing that I really worked on was uh, <clears throat> was uh, a novel that didn't get published. Um, and um, although it got close, it found myself a fancy agent, uh, and uh, you know at least 25 people took a look at it, although decided not to run with it. But it landed into the lap of James Patterson, and uh, I guess unbeknownst to me, he was looking to partner up with someone because he wanted to he wanted to bring out a, a second crime series to Alex Cross and. Uh, he needed someone because it, it, it centered around four women crime fighters. It became the Women's Murder Club. Um, he needed someone who wrote women's women well, women well, and uh, um, that's how sort of how I came recommended from the president of Little Brown. So uh, I, I uh, met with him at a diner in White Plains in Westchester, in New York, where we both lived. Um, and uh, we decided to go forth together, me ecstatically, because after being rejected on it, I had I didn't have a plan B. Him cautiously, because I'd never published anything, um, and uh, other than this one, I'd never published anything, and the only thing he'd read of mine was this one rambling thriller that didn't quite connect. Um, so the first book we did went to number one. So it's why I can kind of say that. So did the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. But um, I don't think there's too many people walking the planet that can make the same claim, even though it wasn't uh, my name that was uh, um, fueling the sales. It was Patterson's, of course. Well, but it it, it sure uh, it sure didn't help your stand. I mean, it sure didn't hurt your standalone career after that. I mean, that's that's quite a launching pad. Uh, no, I but, was the beneficiary of good timing with Jim um, <laughs> because I was his first co co writer. And um, when I went to do my own thing um, on the Blue Zone, um, it I, I I was able to sort of be received by publishers as someone with bestseller status. And the book actually did make it to, I think, number 10 or maybe it was 12 on the Times list and uh, and uh, um, got published in about 25 countries. So it didn't hurt my transition at all coming from him. But the truth of the matter is not many have made that leap successfully. So it hasn't really been a springboard for, for other talent. Where does your uh, your love for mysteries and thrillers come from? I read them. Uh, it, it was what I most enjoyed reading at a certain phase of my life. And when I made the transition for, to writing, I said that I wasn't going to do it unless I felt that I could do it in, with some economic gain. Because the work that I was doing before in, in my business career, well, I mean, you know, we we lived okay. 
So, so I, I one, I wanted the economics of it, and two, putting people in suspense is what's always kind of intrigued me. It's what I love to do as a as a writer. Although I've lately, I think, moved beyond that as sort of my number one motivation. Um, and, uh, um, you know, so, so the genre, you know, I, I kind of grew up, gee, let's see if I can, you know, Marathon Man and, uh, um, you know, the Odessa File and uh, Morris West, Shoes of the Fisherman and the Iger uh, Sanction, uh, you know, these, you know, a lot more. I'm uh, Boys from Brazil, Rosemary's Baby, uh, those kind of books, you know. And they were the books I liked to read, and uh, um, you know that naturally translated into the kind of books I wanted to write. When uh, your words, uh, you the first book that you wrote was a, a bit of a rambling thriller that, that made its way to, to James Patterson. Uh, what do you feel like you learned from working with him that then helped you? In your writing career, other other than name recognition, of course, but uh, what yeah, what yeah, uh, did yeah. you get from no, the experience? I, I mean, I'd say at least two things. One, principally, he was an outliner, and uh, every book I did with him began with an outline that he would give me. Some more, um, some a bit more cursory than others, but an outline. And I took that as the way that I map out a book. Now, in, in, it actually is my how my agent for plotting a book, I do it and I, I write these outlines and uh, at least at least 50% of the book now. Sometimes I don't go all the way to the end. Sometimes I do. Um, and, um, you know, it's I kind of liken it to playing chess with myself. So always in the outline form, you're staying 10 or 15 moves ahead of yourself. Um, so there was that. And then the other thing is just the construction of of how you know how how to write a thriller that keeps people guessing and and not only keeps people on the edge of their f seat but just keeps posing questions that don't get answered that was always a big thing with him uh, i can't say that i write patterson clones um uh i may have started out that way in my first couple because that's what my publisher wanted me to do and leverage the work that i was doing with jim but I certainly don't now, um, although he seems to like my books a lot more now. So he, you know, I guess, uh, you know, he, he said I, I bump into him every once in a while in Florida and he's he still keeps up with what I write, which I completely appreciate. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, just, just learning the, the right kind of decisions to make in a thriller that become instinctual at a certain point. So working with him on six, five or six books uh, ingrained that in me. Um, you know how far to take a scene. Um, you know what. You know. You know. Always keep putting things out there that aren't fully answered because it keeps driving the pace. For a while, I wrote in the typical Patterson construction of short chapters, and uh, um, and and even the point of view of um, heroes and. Uh, heroes in first person and uh, villains and victims in third person. I, I don't really do that. Um, well, I, you know, it's funny. I guess I did that on this book a little more than I than I normally do. Um, but you know, that sort of stuff. I thought, you know, for a while, it really fueled my career. Um, for some people, outlining is just an insurmountable. Uh, thing they they just yeah. they can't get their mind around why you would do it and uh, or you, you know some people say well if I knew where the story was going uh, then I would have already written it you know or and, and outlining right. is kind of right. writing before you write um, as someone who came into outlining um, that had maybe not been thinking that way uh, were there things that that helped you to wrap your brain around that and to make it part of your your present writing process. Um, uh, like I said, a lot of it was that it became the way that I plotted out a book. I mean, that's literally how I get, you know, from first base. Well, that's going to be a bad analogy because it's a lot more than third or fourth or, or home. Um, 
but but it, it's how I get deep, especially in a, in a story-centric, in a plot-centric story where you don't want to find yourself writing down blind alleys. I find it really helpful. I certainly, if you have, if you have, you know, people aspiring to do this among your listeners, I, I and, and they're writing this kind of book, I would certainly recommend doing it. Um, and I don't mean outlining like, you know, one, one A, one B. I mean, you know, writing abridged versions of the chapters. Um, whether they're a third of a page or half a page, uh, you know, I would write outlines with dialogue and 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 map it out to the ending. As a matter of fact, um, two of the books I have written, I sold as outlines, including my first, uh, The Blue Zone. Um, I sold it as an outline, had five publishers bidding on it, and uh, you know, but it was an in-depth outline. And it's, it, it, you know, my own history with Jim showed that I knew how to take a book to completion. But it is sort of laborious work. It's mentally tough work. And you have to trust what you're putting down because um, you don't have to stick to it, of course. You can always deviate, but you want this to be a, an exercise worth the time and the effort you're putting into it. So anyway, to me, it's become second nature. Then there, there are books. I think this last one was a book that I didn't fully outline out. Um, and, you know, I, I'm sort of trying to play it a little more organically and see if that makes a difference at all. But, um, but I kind of find that half the people outline and half the people don't. I've done talks on outlining at thriller conventions, and it sort of breaks down that for as many people say they outline and. Uh, there are people that just say they totally write organically and, and don't know what to do when they come to the page, which I think is always a, a lot of bull, because I, I just can't, literally can't conceive of anybody working that way. So I don't think, I don't think everybody's being totally truthful when they say that, but that's just me. Well, I, I think a lot of people are, are somewhere in the middle. I, I don't know anyone, you know, I've actually met a couple of people who, who have said um, that they come to the page just completely blank and and the story they're just going to follow it as it goes um, I think most people have have an idea where they're going uh, if not kind of this overarching uh, thing in their head they may not write it down but the the outline is there um, well yeah, I mean I, an I, idea on a daily basis it's what I, I mean I think everyone must have a sense of you know this is what my story is going to be that I'm going to work on but I'm talking coming to work every day and what it is that I'm going to be working on, you know. And if I didn't outline, it, I'd be, I'd have a lot more um, consternation than I have, than I currently have in, in, in this sort of work. So, well, the the new book, and and I've had it for a few weeks now. Um, and when when I got it uh, from our faithful UPS driver, um, you know, the the, the cover is intriguing. Uh, that first caught my eye, and then I saw your name, and then you know a lot of the the press materials in it talk about um, you know Andrew Gross switching from from th writing mystery thrillers to historical fiction, and while it's absolutely historical fiction, um, this this reads like uh, a historical thriller. Uh, you know mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. that you, you it is it is absolutely you uh, writing this book, if you know what I mean. Like anyone who mm -hmm. loves your previous writing. Is going to love this book, even uh, though it's not in a modern, present-day thriller setting. Um, can Can you talk a little bit about what the what the idea for the story was that that captured your imagination? You know, and and we we talk a lot about ideas for stories being all around us, but there's something about that that one idea that kind of floats above the rest. What What was it? For right. the fifth column. Yeah, I, I'm happy to. But in, in truth, it's never one idea for me. It's usually three, and I have to sort of triangulate between three things that flesh out a novel. Um, you know, just, just uh, you know, quickly, in terms of what the book is about, the fifth column uh, takes place in New York City in the months before America joined World War II, um, before we were attacked at Pearl Harbor. But in Europe, uh, the war has been raging for two years. However, in the United States, the, the country uh, is cleaved down the middle between people who want to come to the defense of Britain, um, interventionists and isolationists, the America First Party, et cetera, who argue that um, it's Europe's war and uh, we should be staying out of it. Um, but in that time, these fears of German spy rings embedded into everyday life 
um, are rampant. Um, so we have our character, Charlie Mossman, who's a uh, husband and, and father who has fallen from grace. He's lost his job as a professor. His marriage is in demise, and, and he even has lost his freedom because when we meet him on a specific night, um, he gets into an unfortunate bar fight over someone challenging him as a Jew, um, and, uh, uh, and an innocent bystander is killed. Um, all of this due to his drinking. Um, so, uh, but in trying to resurrect with his six-year-old daughter, who now lives in, uh, with his mo her mother in the German-speaking neighborhood of, of Yorkville, um, Charlie begins to think that the kindly Swiss, elderly Swiss couple down the hall, this charming, urbane, worldly couple, um, are not who they say they are, and they're very interested in his daughter. They want to take, their, take her under, uh, under their wing, but in fact uh, could be Nazi spies. Um, and that threat grows as America finally gets into the war, and it ultimately becomes more lethal. Um, and, uh, you know, w w so, so what I sort of like about that is this Hitchcockian sense uh, of, of um, you know, your, your narrator is, is a bit disgraced, but he sees things that no one else can see, but nobody will believe him because of his past, his rocky past. So he's just not a believable figure, and he's the only one who sort of can see what it is. That, so when you mention, like, what did I come to, originally um, it was the background. Uh, which intrigued me um, uh, uh, about uh, uh, this part of World War II where everyone sort of thought that we were always the good guys and always the ones who stood up, but there were two years that we did nothing but remain neutral while, while England was pummeled. Um, and also in that time, how Nazis were tolerated by the State Department. Um, by I, I mean, the night that this book begins, chapter one, um, is a night where 22,000 Nazis were, were cheering wildly in Madison Square Garden for anti-Semitic speeches by, uh, by pro-Hitler uh, figures. Um, you can't even believe that that actually happened in New York. It's, it's staggering. So you had this sort of background, which was one thing. You had the idea of the, um, the, the Nazis next door, um, down the hall in this case, which, which sort of was an intriguing thing to me. And then the last, as I said, was this sense that we have a, a non-believable narrator who we, who we start to know is right in his, in his suspicions, but that no one else will believe because of his past. So it's kind of those three things linked together, triangulated together, that formed the book for me. There's a... Uh... There's a lot of historical fiction uh, right now dealing with the World War II era, and, and most of it uh, centers around America's involvement with that. And, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of interest in that in that time uh, right now. And, and probably something uh, you know, that has to do with it is the, the fact that we're losing so many people from that generation and and soon they'll all be be gone. And if we don't capture these stories and these these feelings around mm -hmm. that, you know, they're they're destined to be lost to history. What we don't see is is absolutely what you're writing here. That period just before the war, and and it's it's really frightening uh, to think of it because we do want to think of ourselves as the better version of ourselves, and that that you know we mm -hmm. as Americans, uh, you know, did the right thing. And it's just not always the case. Uh, how did you right. go about doing research for this, and uh, and what what things surprised you that you came upon? Well, the things that surprised me most was the degree of, uh, of willingness of America to kind of accept what was happening in Germany and not challenge it. Um, and, and even after the persecution of the Jews started, you know, I, I guess it's become common knowledge that as great a president as Roosevelt was, he in the end was no great friend to the Jews, having allowed the camps to continue when they probably could have done something to interfere, disrupt, you know, um, and also the whole thing about the St. Louis, which I don't want to go into, but the ship that was never allowed to dock in the United States with Jewish immigrants on it. Um, but so that's kind of what surprised me this this evening 
at the Madison Square Garden was a shocker to me. Um, but, you know, I, in, in a lot of different ways. I mean, I started with a book that I read for The One Man, which was another World War II story that I wrote um, about my wife's family's experience in the Holocaust, where much of it takes place at Auschwitz. And the book that I read was called Those Angry Days by Lynn Olson. And it was the story of uh, the two overriding figures of, uh, in America of that time, one of them being FDR, and the other one, speaking for the isolationists, was Charles Lindbergh, the aviator. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's a great book. And that provided some of the, some of the background that then I dug into more. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, but a lot of it in terms of research still is an online kind of thing. You know, it's, it's more what people were, how people comported themselves when, then, what they wore, what they smoked, meaning cigarettes, you know, what they, uh, you know, what the city looked like at that time in Yorkville, where a lot of this book takes place, which is on the Upper East Side, like 86 to 96. What did the storefronts look like? There, there are still businesses there. Schaller Weber Meats, which I think is a national brand, is still on the, is still there. Or these German businesses, uh, Cafe Geiger, Rheingold Beer. So you know, a lot of it is just sort of setting, setting the scenes and putting in the kind of nuance and detail that uh, doesn't make an encyclopedia out of your book, but at least gives the reader a sense that they're being transported into a different period in time. The, uh, what does the, the title, The Fifth Column, refer to? Well, um, um, it was uh, from a frantic call in the, during the Spanish Civil War that a loyalist general made that he was being attacked in Madrid by four Republican columns, one from the north by five columns, sorry. One from the north, one from the south, one from the northwest, one from the southeast. And the fifth column, he said, the most lethal is attacking us from within. And uh, he talked about this network of spies and saboteurs. And uh, that um, reflects um, what the fears were in terms of German influence in the United States then. And in fact, there was such a fifth column called the Duquesne Spy Ring. The leader of it was named Duquesne, where he put together this this large, like 33-person network of uh, of pro professionals that were placed inside uh, um, companies, and they actually got the plans for um, a, a a super secret sp um, a bombing site in a plane, a bombing uh, a, a, um, site to accurately bomb. Um, that was created by the, built by the Norden company that they actually transmitted back to Germany. And, and uh, this network was uprooted, called a fifth column, and uh, um, it, it still is the largest spy network ever, ever uncovered in the United States. The fifth column uh, came out yesterday uh, when we're recording this. It's available everywhere in hardback. Kindle edition, audio book edition. Uh, Andrew, this book is oddly prescient for uh, for the world we live in now, in in a very unsettling way. Uh, and I guarantee listeners that this book will keep you up at night and leave you with lots of uh, questions at the end and and make you think about the world that we're living in. Um, Andrew, thank you well, so thank much you. for joining me today. Uh, if if, My if people are just learning about you, God forbid, is there a place they can find you online? Yes, of course. Uh, any writer ever say no? Uh, AndrewGrossBooks.com <laughs> is my website, and uh, I'm, you know, like a lot of writers, generally on Facebook for a little bit every day. So anybody wants to go find me there, I always love interacting with readers. So I invite you to find me there, and thank you for the time to go through this. Thanks to Andrew Gross for joining me today. You can find all of the archives of the show at hankgarner.com. Leave us a comment to show some love for the show and for our guests. Be sure to use the Amazon links in the show notes and show some support for the authors that we have and for the show. Stay tuned now for an audiobook clip from Richard Glebe's The Jason Crane Series. Jason yanked the coils of safety rope to one shoulder and heaved them out the attic window. 
The bundle bounced over the roof line and dropped to the yard below. He tightened the harness, making sure the shoulder straps were snug over his sweatshirt. He threaded his rope through the braking device, tested it, and clipped everything to the carabiner at his navel. So far, so good. Fireman Mike would be proud. His stomach flipped as he neared the octagonal window. Had he tied the correct knots? Would he get himself killed? Weeks had passed since Mike's tutorial and... But he had to attempt the break-in now, while both Van Brunts were at the Christmas Eve service. He swung his legs through the window and felt for the roof. His sneakers gripped the shingles and he wriggled out, grateful for once to have feet as big as snowshoes. He pulled on a ski mask and sang, Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever a spider can. He lowered his body. Wind punched him in the jaw like a supervillain, surprising him. His sweatshirt rode up and snow burrowed into his navel. He looked down but couldn't see his feet. He relaxed his hands and put a few ounces of weight on the rope. Clots of snow broke away, dove over the edge, and took far too long to hit ground. He drew his rope around the pipe and pulled tight. Now he could drop. No, you will not drop. You will repel. You will repel very safely. He backed towards the edge, towards the point of no return. The backyard lurched into view. It was a four-story fall, and he probably hit the stairs on the way down. He sledded helplessly. His legs fell, swung, and kicked the side of the house. Alarm bells went off in his head. He gripped the rope. It looked like nothing. A shoelace. Jason Crane, you're a damn fool. He went limp and fell over. The rope gave a jolt and the harness tried to castrate him. He twisted, trying to save his poor descendants. He began to spin. His arm bashed through a row of icicles. The spin slowed, reversed, and at last he came to a stop with his back to the house, dangling over the backyard. Thank you, rope. That's a good rope. Well done. He tried to turn around, but couldn't. With patience, he worked out a method of kicking in circles and managed to press his sneakers to the side of the house. He needed slack. He gathered his loose rope to the small of his back and disengaged the brake. Zip! He fell fast, all his weight on the rope now. His feet, planted, shot up over his head, the brake caught him, and the rope vibrated as wildly as a guitar string striking a note of panic. Jason heard a crunching sound and looked up. The leaf gutter crumpled and poured a stream of bitter ice water into his eyes. He snarled and wiped his face, dripping humiliation. Jason rested a moment and stared at his reflection in the glass. He was an enormous Macy's balloon drifting over New Jersey, tethered at the navel like underdog. How the hell did you get up here, kid? He did an awkward split, one foot above the window and the other below, hanging sideways with his weight on one hip. He closed his eyes and reached for the sill, crouching against the side of the house. His fingernails found the weather stripping, and he tugged. Locked. He cursed and tugged again, anger rising. He grabbed the frame with both hands and pulled with all his spider strength, Something popped. The window rose and the curtains splashed out. Jason dove headfirst into the fabric, wriggled and kicked, let out some rope and fell with a wump into his archenemy's lair.